Okay, this is take two with Cathay. Was my last flight with them a one-off or a preview of what's to come? We've got a trip report filled with a new aircraft, new seat, and a flagship lounge. So let's get into it. Welcome to Hong Kong. If you'd like to know the exact fare that I paid for my flight, or my next 5 videos in queue, please check out the description below. And if you're new here, hi there and welcome to the channel. My name is Kevin. I think that the world needs a bit more honest travel content these days, so I make airline trip reports, high-end hotel reviews, and cruise ship tours as well, all without invitation. I always film without the company's knowledge and I self-fund my trips to be sure I get a true experience. Then I give you nothing more than my own personal, honest, unbiased opinion. I just got off a really short red eye from Jakarta on one of Cathay's long haul A330s and it wasn't exactly wonderful. So here's to hoping that this second little flight is just a little bit better. Luckily, as has always been the case, transferring in Hong Kong's international airport is a breeze. This airport was opened in 1998, built on reclaimed land and replaced the legendary Kai Tak Airport which served Hong Kong with its single runway in Kowloon Bay for over 73 years. At 2 minutes past midnight on July 6, 1998, Cathay 251 took off bound for London Heathrow, the last commercial departure. The same morning at 6.25 am, Cathay 889 from New York's JFK landed and was the first commercial arrival here at the new airport. I've got a bit of a walk ahead of me as I head to the Wing Business Class Lounge. Cathay Pacific was formed at the end of World War II by two ex-US Air Force pilots who wanted to begin flying a DC-3 for cargo runs between Australia and China. They bought the aircraft, named Betsy, from Bushfield in New York in 1945 and soon began runs between Sydney and Shanghai, including stops in Manila, Hong Kong, Singapore, Saigon and Bangkok along the way. They saw initial success and began to attract some unwanted attention from the ROC government, their planes having been detained several times in Shanghai. Let's put a pin in that for a moment and we'll check out the lounge. Throughout COVID, Cathay's lounge openings were very sporadic with a dismal number of passengers passing through at some points, but the wing was the first to reopen full time. So, before COVID, Cathay had always been my premium economy airline of choice. When I couldn't find a deal in business class, I would fly Cathay in premium economy as they were the fastest total time at just over 19 hours between my two home bases. AKA, I'd never been in one of the Cathay lounges before today. And after my visit here today, I do have to ask one question. What's all the fuss about? Some people talk about these lounges as if they were built with silk spun in the heavens themselves. Don't get me wrong, it's a nice lounge. There were comfortable seats, there was decent food. The noodle bar was okay, but to be honest, the noodles at China Airlines Lounge in Taipei are better. I don't know, maybe my expectations were just too high. Maybe my brain wasn't caffeinated enough at the time. Anyway, back to the story. After the harassment from the ROC government, Cathay decided to move their operations to Hong Kong and quickly grew from there, with nine aircraft on hand by 1947. Cathay being an ancient name for China, and Pacific, the ocean that they wished one day to fly across, seemed to be the perfect name at the time. In the years that followed, the Hong Kong government split operations giving Cathay all routes to the south and Hong Kong Airways all routes to the north. The PRC and the Korean War changed the dynamic to the north quite a bit, so in 1959, Cathay bought out Hong Kong Airways. By the 60s, they flew their one millionth passenger, by the 70s, they had 707s, and by the 80s, they had began flying non-stop to London, going public in Hong Kong a few years later. Currently, they fly to 81 destinations from their base in Hong Kong. Still not nearly at pre-COVID numbers, but they're getting there. In 1994, the parent company, Swire Pacific, acquired significant shares in Dragonair and 75% of the cargo airline Air Hong Kong. 
Swire continues to be Cathay's largest shareholder with 42%. Behind them are Air China with 28%, Qatar Airways with 9%, and the Hong Kong government with 6%. Interestingly enough, Cathay also owns 16% of Air China, in an aviation ownership revolving door of sorts. I really do love the gates here. From the LED surround on the jet bridge doors, which show you the weather where you're going to, to the overhead LED ticker tapes splitting up the boarding queues, to the animated airport codes on the signs. Really cool and smart touches. In 2020, Cathay Pacific folded Cathay Dragon into its brand, which is how today's flight, or at least how today's aircraft came to be. Prior to this merger, in 2020, Cathay Pacific didn't operate any narrow-body planes. If you're curious about a bit more of Cathay's modern history, check out my last review linked above and below. As for now, it looks like boarding is about to begin right on time. If you support the content that I've been putting out on the channel, or just honest travel content in general, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe. Those are the two easiest ways that you can tell YouTube that this video is worth your time. For anyone interested in supporting, my Patreon is also linked in the description below. Thanks for watching today. For this morning's flight stats, we'd be taking off a minute ahead of schedule and heading up to 37,000 feet for our 76 minute flight across the strait. If you're ever curious why I usually don't choose the first row, even though technically I love bulkheads, well, this is why. Doesn't really give you much of an opportunity to get this boarding shot without some blatant in-your-face camera work. But for today's flight, I wanted to check out this first row for a very specific reason. So these are the new business class seats for Cathay's A321neos, and the bulkheads have the legroom built into the bulkhead, which is an interesting solution for splitting up the legroom evenly and also allows the bulkhead passengers to keep their smaller bags with them at their feet since the setup here is the same as the rows behind. The new interior colors are very smart looking and look to be the same materials that Cathay will be debuting in their soon to come revamped long haul business class, but I miss the green, which I really enjoyed. On their own, the new colors aren't boring, but when you combine them with everything else that Cathay is doing at the moment, it just becomes a bit too sedate. Sedate was the word. That was the word I used in the last review. That said, the finishing details are really beautiful and refined, and there are quite a few storage cubbies located next to you and down by your feet. Not a lot, but keep in mind these are just for short flights. The ginormous tray table deploys like so, and there's also a tablet or phone holder built into the top. Non-alcoholic pre-departure drinks were passed out, and I love the little dialog box on the bottom of the screen which is fixed on the flight info. Not too sure how I feel about this camera though. Why, why do we need this? The robotic safety video began, and we pushed back as my neighbor continued his FaceTime after being told to put it away like 33 times. Anyway, definitely no mistaking that you're in Hong Kong now.
The taxi was pretty quick and we were soon lined up for takeoff. The spool up, takeoff, and airport stats are coming up next. I was expecting one of those lengthy, out-of-the-way routings that sometimes you get on this route to avoid mainland airspace, but was surprised to get a pretty straight-up shot to Taipei today. Entertainment-wise, Cathay has a pretty decent selection of movies on offer, but the thing that surprises me is how diverse the selections are. Not something that I expect from Cathay. The headphones on offer were the same as my last flight, I think, but the packaging was different. It makes me wonder if the ones on my last flight weren't actually cleaned. A very nice Bramford pillow is on offer, though you're not really going to have time to use it on a flight like this. And finally, the blanket as I mentioned is crappy, and likely the only thing in the full Cathay onboard experience that doesn't feel premium. Here's the full menu for this flight. Note that there are no wine prices today because there is no wine menu on this morning 60 minute flight. Choices for breakfast were dim sum or a mushroom omelet. I love mushrooms, but generally on airplanes, they scare me a little bit. Nothing quite like a microwave shiitake in a confined space to awaken the senses. So I went with dim sum. It was precisely as good as dim sum could be on a plane. The glutinous rice was the best part, likely since it was supposed to be sticky, as opposed to the other pieces, which were all sticky due to sitting for too long. But I digress. It was all pretty good. Not really complaining. As for the 10 second toilet tour, well, frankly, it could have been 8 seconds. Not much to see here, but it was clean as a whistle. As we pass by some majestic looking mountains on our descent into Taipei, let me briefly explain why I did not like the seat, or rather why I wouldn't be comfortable in them for more than an hour or two. To put it bluntly, they were made for shorter people. I'm six foot tall, around 181 centimeters. The arms of the chair and the tray table were both just way too low. If I was like four or five inches shorter, or maybe had a shorter torso, maybe it would have been just fine. But this seat gave me a bit of a backache after just an hour, simply for constantly shifting sides and hunching over to eat. Okay, enjoy the rest of the landing and the arrival stats on this overcast morning, approaching Taipei from the north. And that is that. Some would say it was a peach of a flight. Get it? Again, for a short flight, I'd be okay in the seat, but I would definitely avoid the A321s on some of their longer routes that they use them on. As for service, I am happy to report that it was fantastic on board this time. Attentive, and I mean, they're basically forced to be efficient. Hopefully my previous flight was really just a one-off.
So I really do hope that you enjoyed this trip report today. If you did, please be sure to click that thumbs up button and subscribe with notifications on so you don't miss out any of my new videos. I'll see you next time from the Hotel Proverbs in Taipei. Oh, and thanks for watching till the end.